Uh, I'm Glyn Mathias. I was uh, a pupil here from 1956 to 1962. In fact, I've just seen my name up on the, on, on the board there for the first time. Uh, it seems a long time ago now, and this is the first time I've come back. Well, I'm uh, Diane Hopkin. I was here 1955 to 1962, uh, which means that uh, Glenn caught up and overtook me during that period. <laughs> um, we were con direct contemporaries, um, and I came here uh, on a Thomas Phillips scholarship, and I, until recently, thought I was the only one, and I realized there were several other people who had that scholarship, which I think is absolutely disgraceful. <laughs> Well, uh, why did you, uh, um, how, how did I manage to catch up with you? I'm, I'm, tr I'm struggling to remember a, this. No, Glenn, you know very well, we did history together in the sixth form. I was always in your shadow, dear boy. You know that. <laughs> I looked over your shoulders to see how I could answer questions. No, seriously, yeah. I think what happened is that there was a process of accelerating people yes. into GCSEs and the rest of it. You were a year younger yes. than the rest of us. That's right. And so you came in at a very young age. Um, I, I certainly remember taking GCSEs <coughs> at... Uh, uh, the age of very early 15, yeah. uh, and so I took my A-levels at uh, uh, late 16, early 17, uh, and then I had to do an extra year in the sixth form, uh, just because I had to wait, because I, couldn't, I was too young to go to university. It seemed, we seemed rather pointless. It was, and it's a very strange thing, because looking back, I mean, to be honest, um, we, I don't think we appreciated then exactly what we were actually getting, mm. and I think, you know, we can talk about this in a minute, but I arrived uh, full of enthusiasm, and I have to be honest with you, I, I think I peaked at 11, you know, and I think it's been downhill ever since. Um, because I, I, think, I think Professor Sir Dan Hopkin can't possibly say that. Uh, yes, but looking at the number of other sirs around, I think you can revise that view. Um, but what I would say is um, I got a lot of, of benefit from a lot of what I had there, but looking back, it was, it was inevitably mixed. In every school, it's yes. mixed. But, you know, we were young, very young, and I think we grew up rather quickly. We did, uh, and uh, I didn't know what to expect when, when, when I came. Uh, my, my parents chose the school, uh, having uh, looked at various other schools, and they chose this one, and I came not knowing uh, what it would be like. Uh, and to be honest, when you first came here, and I was particularly small, I suppose, and remained small, uh, but it was, uh, it was a fairly brutal existence. I mean, I was bullied from time to time, what you now call I, I didn't, I, I, it wasn't me, was it? It wasn't you, but why not? <laughs> no. You were far too nice. No, 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 no. I, and so, I mean, there were times when it, it, was, it was, could be very miserable, but the teaching, as you suggest, uh, was of, of a quality uh, which sort of took you onwards. Uh, and uh, no doubt helped me in my, in my career. I think, though, I think maybe people uh, have a different experience now, but, of course, we were streamed according to ability, yeah. um, and therefore there was the A stream and the B stream, which took longer. And I'm not sure whether they had the same deal, whether they had the same quality of teachers. I'm not sure. I and mean, that would be a question which we'd have to ask them. But I got the impression that the academic stress was on the A stream they're the ones who are expected to do well. And to be frank, I think many people doing that other stream were expected often to leave school at the age of 16 or whatever to go and do something else, usually go back to the family business or something. Or the family farm in many cases. A family farm in many cases. Yeah, I, I, and we were lucky, at least I, I, you and I were, I think, in, in, in the teachers that, that we had. I think they were a mixed bag of teachers, as you oh, yeah. tend to get in any school. Uh, and we were very lucky in having... Uh, uh, Charlie Bell uh, to, oh, yes. uh, to teach us history. I mean, he was a, a vivid teacher. I mean, he could really recreate uh, events in the past as if they were sitting there in front of you. And I can remember this uh, to this day. Uh, and he inspired me with my love of history. There's absolutely no question about that. Although he did have coughing fits, I remember. He, he, he smoked so heavily uh, that he was suddenly burst into, co into, into a coughing fit but, and have to leave the room for long <laughs> periods. <laughs> Absolutely. But then let's forget. I mean, there was something, something very romantic about Charlie Bell, who ended up actually as acting warden here, I think, right towards the end of his career. Charlie Bell had played cricket for Somerset before the Second World War. He was in Monte Cassino yes. in... In general, in, in, the, in the Eighth Army. He was a tank commander. He was a tank commander. Yes. And therefore, when he talked about war, I mean, yes. he was one who saw Monte Cassino Monastery destroyed by his own yes. artillery. And yes. that's an extraordinary thing. Yes. But of course, above all, he ran the drama uh, 
performances. And of course, we, were, we had no choice in the matter. You know, they put up the list and saying, you know, yes. this, you're going to do this part. And I'm afraid for the first two performances, I actually played the part of very aged women. <laughs> Um, I, I, think, was, I, think, I think they gauged my ability as an actor very early on. I think I was uh, second page in one, in one drama, uh, and the next one I was the third priest. <laughs> so it was pretty clear. Yeah, but, yeah, but clear no, 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 but Glenn, let's get right. I'd rather have been a page than the queen in Cymbeline, <laughs> you know, or, 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 you know, Madame, whatever it is in Romeo and Juliet, uh, Cap, uh, uh, Juliet's mother, yes. um, which, and then ended up the only male part I played was Oberon in yes. A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'm not quite sure actually was that the image I wanted to cast. <laughs> I remember actually in a line to say, um, which had a line something like, "I know the sweet briars and the sweet woodbine," and everybody <laughs> burst out laughing. I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was certainly something which set you up because yes. it took you out of the ordinary run of things yes. and yes. you know gave you a sense of being yes. something you know able to do something different and, and the other man the other teacher who did did exactly that and took you out of yourself and took you out of the place where you were in uh, was Archie Moore oh yes uh, the English teacher Gosh. Uh, and he he became a, a, a head teacher I think somewhere in the, in, in the Midlands uh, subsequently uh, but he had the ability to talk about uh, uh, current affairs and modern issues in a way which nobody else did in the school uh, and I remember there was it, it, because he was so easily diverted from the lesson. Absolutely, there, there would be there would be a plan got together very quickly before the lesson, <laughs> and somebody uh, would ask a question about the last film we'd seen in in the gym or or a book they'd read, and, and we would see how long we could divert him from the lesson. And he, and he, he never sussed it. We always picked somebody else each time to ask the question, and he never sussed it. This, was a, this, was, a, this, was, a, this was a ruse. <laughs> but he, I think he was responsible for something which was, to me, the most civilising moment. Because I think, I think it's fair to say it was a pretty brutal place in it some was. respects. It was. You know, getting up early in the morning to warm up the water for the senior boys, you know, while you had to wash in cold water yourself. I was to remind you of exactly where you are in the pecking order. It was a kind of social Darwinism, yes. you know. Yes. I mean, all of that was something which was meant to make you stronger. I'm not sure it made you stronger. But then... Towards the end, they set up the Sixth Form Society, where we used to have cheese and wine as Sixth Formers. <laughs> that was amazing. But you're absolutely right about the, the brutality of the existence to begin with. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, the school hadn't changed since before the Second no. World War. Uh, and, the, and this was now the, the, the late 50s. Mm. Uh, and it was still felt that you could have been in the 1920s or mm. 1930s. Uh, and there was no hot water, as you say. You had to fill the basin in the morning, uh, in winter. Uh, but, but otherwise, it, the taps would be frozen. Sometimes you had to break the ice in the basin. Uh, there was no heating. No. Uh, there were bare floorboards. Etc. Etc. And it's a bit uh, like how we live now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, speak for yourself. But, but uh, I mean, it, it took some getting used to that. I mean, it, it did toughen you up. There's no question about that. Uh, oh well, there's no question. I mean, in fact, uh, I think the only other thing is, uh, often my wife and my kids ask me, "How is it you can eat anything?" Yes. To which I say, "Well, I had seven years of." not being able to eat hardly anything. Um, and I, and I remember I, my, my parents would send me food parcels, like the Red Cross sending to, you know, to prisoner of war camps in the Second World War. But the only problem is, is if, I remember them sending, you know, I used to say, what would you like to have? Well, these little orange, oranges, and they're a great luxury. Yes. You know, they used to come, you know, these packages arrived. But I remember we had, I think it was the year before you arrived, we had um, uh, glandular fever outbreak. No, I don't remember that. And a glandular fever outbreak. And what happened is three of us, Andreas, Andres Leolmanis, who now is a surgeon in Canada, and Wishlau Gadula, who's still actually uh, in the area, and I, we decided we wanted to become ill. <laughs> because obviously these people are having a far better deal. The life than in the were. sand was well, wonderful by absolutely. comparison. Absolutely. Anyway, we were desperate to be ill so we could actually have some decent food. Anyway, um, I remember vividly um, we went out there, we made ourselves physically sick by eating all sorts of rubbish and we went and the temperature gone up and we were then put to this sick bay and we caught glandular fever right <laughs> what a mystery but what happened is when when my parents sent the food parcel i was told by the matron she said uh, hopkin um 
your food parcel arrived. So it's only fair that we should share it out amongst everybody. <laughs> Do you know, I suddenly realised I'm not a Democrat at all. I don't believe in this stuff. My food, my spare food was sent around to everybody. But seriously, it made you realise, actually, how important it is to recognise food for what it is. Yes. When I went to university, there was a strike over winter salad, as they called it. I have to tell you, I thought it was a luxury. Well, I thought it was amazing. You, you may forget, but uh, going into the dining hall just a few moments ago, uh, I remembered our first year there was a strike. Absolutely. In, in, in the dining hall. Uh, I don't remember anybody planning for it, but somebody must have planned for it, uh, because when the call came up to go and get the food, nobody got up. No, the entire school stayed where they were, and they didn't move. And I remember the cook being taken away in tears. And, and, and but what were you all beaten? Beaten afterwards. <laughs> I can't. Well, there were, too many, there were too many of us in that case to beat. <laughs> no, but it was. But the food. But having said that, it did really. And I'm. I'm not trying to romanticise this. But it did really make you appreciate, actually, that whatever's put in front of you has got some yes. kind of virtue. I, I think. You know, I think. I'm, even Irish stew. I, I think it ruined my table manners forever, my dear. <laughs> well, I never had any. I mean, you used to have those. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, 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 a pile of bread was put on the table. Yes. Do you remember that? And it was a, a cut loaf on its end, a huge cut loaf on its end, sliced. Uh, and you had to wait till the, to the word, uh, and then you, you got your hand out as fast as you could. So it was like this to get a, a, piece, of, a piece of bread. Do you remember that? We're not going to go also and talk about the experience of the rotation system, where you, every Sunday, the top two, the top four, moved to the bottom of the table and then worked your way up every Sunday. But that meant, of course, that whoever the top of the table doled out the food, which meant that the people at the end of the table got the least amount yes. to make sure the people at the top of the table got the maximum amount. Yes. But the people at the end of the table were the ones who had to wash up afterwards. I have to say, that is an experience which I think, <laughs> not quite sure what was that preparing you for, you know, I'm in life. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was cheap, is the answer. <laughs> it was cheap. <laughs> cheap to run. Uh, but yes, uh, that's... Uh, but uh, I mean, we, uh, as, as you grew older, I mean, I, I think I built a sort of a carapace, I suppose, yeah. which uh, you, 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 uh, you, an, an exterior which allowed you to, 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 cope with all, to, cope with, to cope with all this. And I focused on the academic work. I was no good at sport. Okay. Uh, I, I was, oh, you were good at tennis. Uh, well, I played tennis because I was no good at cricket. Uh, and there were a handful of us who played tennis, and it was a way of escaping from the school and going to play down on the tennis courts right. in town. Uh, and that was another, another day of escape. But talking about escapes, what I really, really enjoyed were those afternoon summer walks oh, yes. uh, we used to do. I mean, yeah. it was like a wonderful paradise of going out into a different world, walking out to the Dolly Bridge. Yes. Uh, particularly when they, 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 I just remembered, so again sitting in the dining hall, remembered when they, they said, you don't have to turn up for the afternoon tea in the middle of the afternoon anymore. That's right. And, and we could have about three or four hours out in the countryside. And that was like a wonderful release. I, do you know, thinking about this, and we have, you and I haven't talked about this at all no, in all those years. No. There was a sea change, I think. Yes. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that it coincides with a sea change in British public mores. The end of the 50s, the beginning yes. of the 60s yes. is a moment when things changed yes. quite significantly. Yes. And, it, and there was a it, sense... It, it permeated even yeah, here. There was a sense of change here too. And I think two things. First of all, I think there were some teachers who had arrived who were really civilising influences. Yes. Carwin James, you yes. know, well, yes. we can talk about Carwin, but Carwin was my teacher and housemaster, and I think he was... You know, a, a very shrewd. Uh, yeah, not everybody had uh, the same view, but certainly he helped me uh, enormously. But having said that, you know, what I re remember about all of that is television had arrived. We were allowed to watch television programs. We, we had the Sixth Form Society. We went to Stratford to watch plays, yes. which was yes. fantastic. Saw J the young, young Judy Dench. And the not so young Laurence Olivier, um, Peter Atul, yes. Sean Phillips, who, by the way, is living in Spitalfields and is still going strong. She yes. was there. We saw her yes. in uh, yes. in Romeo and Juliet. I mean, there was a moment when things were definitely changing yes. and changing for the better. And in a way, uh, for me, the moment that came was, you know, as you know, I, one of my interests was jazz. I. I got my interest in jazz here in Llandovery against the odds because, in fact, you weren't being taught it. There was a man called Nick Ruddle, who was uh, a classicist, uh, who used to play boogie piano, and he encouraged me, and he was great. And that broke the ice a bit. Yes. But in this hall here, 
I think we can safely say we had the first ever jazz concert. I remember. I remember, I remember, I remember you playing in it. Absolutely. Uh, as you say, uh, things had suddenly relaxed. Absolutely. And, we, and it was probably about the time we got to the sixth form or thereabouts. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And things did suddenly, su su suddenly relax and we were allowed to do things uh, that had uh, seemed a, 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 an age away yeah. uh, when we first But two school. members of that little outfit of six of us, we didn't have much equipment. I think the bass was actually a tea chest with a string, <laughs> and we used the drums from the CCF and the rest of it. It was a bit of a, a put together. But two members of that, Maldwin Pitt and, and David Evans, went on to form the first Welsh rock group, a Blew. Right. Yes, and in his autobiography, David refers to that actual moment when, in fact, they learned their craft mm. here. And I have to be honest with you, Something must have happened because I went to uh, Aberystwyth um, in 62 and I auditioned uh, for jazz. They wanted jazz players and I ended up remarkably in a jazz trio read, led by Roger Lim who ended up actually running Radiophonic Workshop and doing the Doctor Who music uh, whose drummer was Charlie Watts. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, having arrived there, it clearly must have been something in St. Dovery which enabled me yeah. to actually make that transition yeah. very easily yeah. and it wasn't formal it was yeah. the atmosphere yeah. so something happened I think round about that period to yeah. change things yeah. Yeah. well you mentioned Carwin James uh, and uh, and we all remember him and he became so sort of a, a hero some some sanctity around him uh, his memory uh, because of his role uh, uh, with Welsh rugby uh, but he was a very formative influence uh, uh, in school I, rem I remember uh, and he I remember him training us in the Kidadroth uh, and we had to take part in oh, the Irv uh, I can think I can, I think I can still remember the first two lines: a dial a coil, and a start fleer, a mir mir, an And uh, I remember having to share a bed uh, with Pot, my friend Potso Stevens in a vicarage in uh, in Mould, uh, where the Eisteddfod was held, uh, and we took part. I, I don't know if he won, uh, but but Cameron was very keen that we should learn all this. But what was your impression of him? Were your memories good? Uh, yes, I mean, he, he was uh, very concerned about you. I mean, he, he, he was very empathetic. Uh, but there's one thing that, 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 that most people don't believe, uh, because uh, uh, be, uh, we only studied seven O-levels in those days. Yes. Uh, and we were told that uh, we were not allowed to carry on with Welsh. Uh, and so uh, myself and Potso Stevens and one or two others went to see Carwin and said, look, we've got plenty of time. Uh, we can, we're only doing seven O-levels. We, 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 we'd like to do Welsh, Welsh O-level. And he said, no. Why? Uh, I don't think he wanted the work. Uh, really? Uh, he, he, what you don't, uh, are not allowed to say about Carolyn is he was a touch lazy from time to time. Good. Uh, and, and I think that that was, uh, that was the reason. Uh, but I mean, you know, that's, a, that's one p a story amongst many, uh, which were all positive. I'm surprised because I wasn't aware of all that, because being Welsh and I was in the Welsh stream, you know, there wasn't a, uh, an issue really. Mm. But I, this is the first I've heard of that. Lazy, I'm not sure. I mean, certainly unusual um, habits in the sense that he smoked like a trooper but played <laughs> rugby at the same time. And I remember uh, being asked to go down to his car. He had a Riley, very, very flash Riley. I mean, we in the sixth form. And he said, Dan, he said in Welsh, he said, can you go and get me some, some fags from the car? And you go down there and you open the door and there's a little drawer there. And I pulled it open and a whole pile of boxes just fell out. Half of them full, half of them not full. It just occurred to me, you know, how on earth could he have played rugby like that, yeah, you know? Yeah. You know, in between tries, you know, have a fag, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I can remember being given a lift by him uh, down to, I think it's down to Begelli, or maybe it was Kilgetty, I can't remember now, uh, where as a junior team we were playing. On a pitch, I think, was, was on, a, on the top of a mountain, so one side was going down that way and the other side was going down that way. A very difficult game to play. And I was, of course, from scrum half. Uh, and uh, every, by that time, everybody was getting rather bigger than me, and I played very badly, and that was the last game I ever played. <laughs> <laughs> you, you remind me of something else, though, which is quite interesting. The cultural side, we had a Stedvods, yes. which were a Stedvodai, which was really quite a high point, because, you know, you had to compete. I have to say, there were, in my peer group, there were a couple of very, very good pianists, so I never really... Uh, did very well classically. One stayed here to teach, uh, Thomas, um, Hugh Thomas, I think his name. Hugh, of course, John Hugh. Uh, he was here for years and years. Uh, he was a very good pianist. So you always used to, you know, appalling performances used to beat me all the time. But um, 
But that's why I turned to jazz, because it was much easier. Nobody else could do that. Uh, but, but we also competed in the most unusual things. We actually had a Morris dancing group. I don't remember that. Yeah, you weren't part of that. You were far too sophisticated. Um, <laughs> we, we actually went to, did Morris dancing in Cardiff uh, Sophia Gardens with a pig's bladder. And John Williams, who uh, ended up running a newsagent shop, and uh, he used to keep cricket scores, John Williams. Uh, keep scores for cricket club, but he, he was going around beating us with this pig's bladder. And you know, we danced around like that. I, what on earth were we thinking of? I mean, I have no idea. But we also competed very successfully, and this is the other great experience. We, we did key dadros in Welsh to the uh, accompaniment of a harp. And somebody brilliant, I think it was Carwin, fixed that the harpist was Anne Griffiths, who became, of course, one of the most celebrated. Uh, harpists mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. So we turned up the National Third. It was a no contest. <laughs> How could anybody possibly compete? We, did, we, we could have been the worst reciters in the world, but we had the best accompanist <laughs> in the world. So we just walked it. And it was, you know, ultra modern. It was brilliant. Did you take any part in debates? Uh, I must have, but I must say my memory has been bleached. Possibly for good reason. <laughs> no, but they were quite challenging things, weren't yes. they? Yeah. You have to stand up and defend a position for maybe five, ten minutes mm -hmm. and answer, you know, the criticisms. It's a tremendous preparation. Because what it gives you the confidence to stand up there and, you know, make a fool of yourself. Ask yourself all these years later. Uh, and this is the first time you've been back, isn't it? It's the first time I've been back. Nobody asked me to come back, but that's a female no, excuse. They, they, no, no, they thought, you were excuse. Too, they thought you were too lofty. <laughs> You're too important. Um, but what do you think, you know, in reflection? Uh, now and again, I'll, I'll just tell the story first and then I'll answer your question. Um, as you will remember, um, as prefects, we, we were, uh, had the, the obligation uh, to administer corporal punishment. Uh, a, a, a job which I did in some, somewhat timidly, I remember. Uh, but I'd forgotten all about this, uh, and about uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I was at a Conservative Party conference, uh, and uh, as a journalist, I hasten to say, uh, and uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, come and see this guy, he wants to tell you a story. Uh, and so I went over, uh, and it was Rod Richards. Oh, my goodness. Uh, a somewhat notorious yes, uh, Conservative indeed. MP. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Sandesi Boy went to the same primary school as me, yes, we at, all go there. At, at, at that time. And he said, I remember you, he said. You tanned me uh, in Llandovery okay. uh, after some mini riot in the dormitory. Uh, and I said, did I? I had no memory of it at all. But he reminded me of this, of, of, of this event. And I was telling this story uh, to my father, who had a, a fellow poet called Raymond Garlick, yeah, uh, who was sitting next to him. And I was telling this story. Uh, and uh, there was a pause of a few seconds. And Raymond Garlick sort of took a puff of his pipe. And he said, well, then, he said, at least you would die knowing you did something worthwhile. <laughs> Well, can I, can I be morally superior to you, uh, Glyn? I'm not quite sure on what goes. I'm going to be very morally superior. You see, uh, I too became a prefect, as did Geron Eckley, and um, we decided that we were not prepared to tan or yeah. punish anybody. Yeah. I came to the conclusion that it was morally reprehensible, yeah. and in fact, I went to see uh, the chaplain who tried to persuade me that it was perfectly all right in the scriptures to go beat little children. <laughs> um, uh, I also have to make another confession, which may or may not, in fact, go down well in the present era. Uh, I resigned from the CCF on grounds of conscience. Mm. And Geron Ackley and I uh, and Yolo were called the Conchies for a period, which I thought was a badge of honor. Uh, but anyway, but we refused to punish anybody, and we were stripped of our ranks of pre 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 yeah. prefects, oh, good and we were restored to the depths of the peasantry. That's something I, I admire, but, but I never joined the CCF. I know you didn't. Because, because my father was a pacifist. I know. Uh, and he, uh, he asked me, do not join the CCF. And being an obedient son, I didn't join the CCF. And good for you. There were two or three of us. Yeah. Uh, and we were told that if we didn't join the CCF, we were going to have to clear stones from Tredegar. Uh, and I gather this was a, uh, for reasons that bec because after the war, it had been dug out right. for potatoes and, and there were a lot of stones in the ground. So previous generation of students had had to do that. Uh, but I never had to do it. They just forgot about us. And we sat in the corner in the classroom and read, uh, and, and read yeah, books. Yeah, but you see, 
because we did it rather ostentatiously, we were punished. <laughs> we were sent to learn Kerdant with a famous that's a singer that's, that's a real called punishment. King Penition. <laughs> so when everybody else was, was doing their marching, we were learning Kerdant and poetry. I have to say, there was nothing wrong with it. I, when I meet people in the First World War commemorations, generals and field marshals and the rest of it, I sometimes manipulate the historical truth and say, well, I was in the uh, CCF for the South Wales borders. Oh, jolly good, they say. <laughs> well, you're one of us then. I don't say, and then I gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have a shooting eight badge. I, I won my shooting eight badge, which may come useful if I become a sniper in my old age. <laughs> Why were you allowed to do, do shoot if you weren't in the CCF? No, no, in my one year I was in the oh, CCF. One year I, I did one year, I did one year of camp, and yes. I decided that uh, that was more than enough yeah. morally. Mm. But, uh, but, you know, that's, that's, I think probably I was a useless soldier as well, which mm. doesn't help. But the one major difference now, of course, uh, which we have to remember, uh, is that there were no girls in the school in our time. Uh, and not, not legally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speak for yourself. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and there are now. Uh, and th uh, that all boys element, I, I think, was another sort of fairly yes, harsh um, uh, element of, 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 of the school. And the presence of, of, of girls has almost certainly softened oh, the, 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 the establishment. Of Absolutely. Girls. And the only time we came into, into any contact with girls when you were, when you were competing in the, in the establishments. Yes. And, you know, there was these extraordinary people. Gosh, you know, there's, there's another gender. Yes. Wow, you know, haven't seen this before. Um, but that probably, I think, probably caused some people a few problems later on in life. I'm quite sure of it. I, I'm not going to go into psychology of single sex boarding schools, but, but no. I, 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 I'm almost certain there was some issue there. The other thing I think, looking back, is you can't rewrite history. You know that because you're a historian, and much as we'd love to rewrite history, you can't. And therefore, you can't say, what if we had never been to Thundabri? Mm, you can't. What do you think, though? Uh, well, Thundabri certainly prepared me uh, for the, uh, the, the outside world uh, by toughening me up. Uh, creating a, a sort of a, a, allowing me to form a, a carapace around me, uh, which helped preserve me um, in school, but helped me preserve me in later life. Uh, so, because the kind of job I did, uh, one came under tremendous pressure. Yes. Uh, as a political editor uh, in London, uh, political parties would try to put pressure on you, politicians would try to put pressure on you, uh, and that ability to be independent uh, and regard and, and uh, take account of what people say, but not necessarily follow what they say. Uh, I think at least my, my existence in Thunder helped me to create that persona which, which, which allowed me to do that. I, th I think it's a very interesting point. And if you look around the room here, you'll see honours boards for going back, well, some of them go back to the 19th century. A number of them in gold is Indian civil service. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> and I think the whole point is it prepared you for actually being able to lead and provide discipline yes. for people, arguably, they believed, didn't have any discipline. A bit arrogant. Sure it's true. a bit arrogant. Of course it is. But they regard it as the pinnacle of achievement. And yes. if you could survive seven years of a kind of brutal existence of some of these schools, yes. then you could do anything. Yes. Yeah? There's an element of truth in that. I think there is an element, element of truth in that. element of truth yeah, in that. Yeah, absolutely. The one other thing I would I, say... I, however, I think it's perfectly possible to become a very civilised human being without going through Oh, I, 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 well, <laughs> let's not dispute that for one moment. There's one other thing, too. When you went to university, most of my contemporaries in university, not like you, because you went to Oxford, where many had been in boarding school, in my case, very few had been at boarding school, so many of them actually were very nostalgic of their homes. They couldn't, they, they weren't able to go back home for, you know, the, the meals, at, you know, being prepared at home. They were used to home comforts, and they found it very difficult. I have to tell you, I found Hall of Residence and anything in university pure luxury. <laughs> pure <laughs> luxury compared with, you know, right. I had my own room. Absolutely. Good heavens, you know. Well, I, well, you, were, you were able to, you had hot water? Well, at, 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 at Jesus, I had to share a room my first year. And I thought this was in, I mean, and we had separate bedrooms and a, and a, and a joint uh, living room. I thought, as you say, I thought this was luxury. I mean, only had to share with one person. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this was amazing. And you didn't have to beat anybody. <laughs> I didn't have to beat anybody. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
No, I think there's no question. I mean, it, it helped prepare you. I mean, I'm not quite sure. In the first half of our time here, I don't think that school necessarily had to be quite like that. Nevertheless, it prepared us for life afterwards. And, and I could just pay one bit of tribute. I mean, we could be very nostalgic. I mean, we are running over times which were sometimes quite lonely and difficult and certainly at the beginning, quite frightening at times. Yes. I mean, there's no question. And over the time, you got over that. Some never did. Some, some never did. actually, th some tried to run away. Yes, um, I, can, I can remember the, 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 somebody driving out to try and catch them. Yeah, well, it was a pretty much terrifying idea, really. You really think of it, you remember the prisoner yes, yes. in that television series, you know, where they were chasing it's after it's people who were escaping. You were never allowed to escape. Uh, you were never allowed to escape. Um, but, and of course, you weren't allowed to see your parents more than twice a term That's or right. something of that well, kind. Once or twice, I mean, um, yes. And, you know, it was, it was a very insular and, and very demanding existence. And then you gradually got over it. But, you know, Looking back, in terms of the academic discipline, you said earlier about history, because you and I were the two who did history together yes. in the sixth form. Uh, I think it was somebody else. Yeah, somebody, I can't remember who it I was. I can't remember who it was, actually. Yeah. Well, somebody, you know, some, <laughs> some professor now. <laughs> but, um, but seriously, um, when I went to Aberystwyth, um, my first tutor there was a man called Gwyn Williams, Professor Gwyn Alf Williams, who is still, to me, one of the greatest lecturers mm -hmm. I've ever heard. Yes. And I wrote an essay, and he called me in, and he said, do you know, he said, I don't know where you were taught history, but whoever taught you history did a bloody good job. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, that's pretty remarkable. Absolutely. You, it was remarkable. And of course, from there on, it was downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we've actually exhausted ourselves now. I think we certainly have. We're not going to reflect on the people we brutalised or punished or, no, or no. bullied. Uh, but um, but no. the one reassurance is, you said that you were bullied early on. Yes. And I'm delighted to say that it wasn't me who did it. <laughs> Do you know something? That's new. The, the window. The window. I mean, that is impressive. Uh, I really like that. It's, I love modern stained glass rather than attempts to imitate uh, middle, -aged stuff, middle Ages stuff. It's, uh, it's, I agree. It's really Entirely classes. agree with that. Classy. And yeah. do you know something? To my eternal shame, I never really paid much attention to the First World War memorial. Apparently and it's been redone. I was, I was going to say, it didn't look like the one been, I it's remember. It's been re, uh, uh, redone because apparently there were some names missing. Uh, and uh, so that it's now, it's, it's been redone. I think it's fantastic though. Were you a chorister? Certainly not. I was. I sat there. I wasn't a junior chorister. I was, uh, I was with the, well, course, the, the, our, the baritones. Our, in our day, the benches were uh, uh, lateral. They were lateral. These have been changed around. Yeah. And I was somewhere down the back there, uh, which is where, where my usual place. But it's the same altar. Yes. Yes. It's, it's just the glass is different, and or it, is it? And it yes. The glass is different, and it really lifts it. I okay. Think. It does. It's, it's a, yes. I, I have no recollection of any sermons in here. Uh, None whatever. Well, you weren't listening. You weren't I was listening. never listening. <laughs> I was sitting down. There. But we sang here. And, of course, they introduced sung Eucharist. Yes. Which was high church stuff. Yes, it was quite so, high church. And we sang, sung Marbeck. Or is it Marleck or something? Yeah. Anyway, I can't remember now. But it was all these, you know, sort of medieval yeah. chanting. There was, one, there was one point in the prayers which I always worried about. Uh, because occasionally they would get to mentioning St. Matthias. <laughs> Who, if you will remember, uh, was on the bench, on, the, bench, on the substitute's bench for the disciples. Uh, and and I, everyone would poke me like this to it in the service if that, if that happened. <laughs> but, uh, otherwise, um, and, uh, I, there were moments to be endured, I think, rather than... Uh, I played the organ That's quite a few changed, times. Changed yeah, the change, absolutely. Yes. But the organ was a bit, a bit hard. I, I never found uh, using my feet and my hands in coordination particularly useful. <laughs> That's why I couldn't play football. <laughs>